but they really should be posted. If they could find a nice forever home together, um, that might be good. But um, the other one, the sixth, the newest one is up for adoption and she's super cute. So hopefully she'll get a great home soon. Um, Tim's. Okay, we are live folks. Oh, I need to make my drink. <laughs> we got a couple minutes before um, people start filtering in. So we'll give people a chance. Oh. drink demo seriously yeah that's a different uh a different podcast right. <laughs> it's a different series <laughs> mixology with todd <laughs> drinking with the aso <laughs> lauren and jerry just said yay you're on <laughs> hey we're here john meisner's watching hi john oh hi bruce kenny oh man wow. good crowd going tonight well, they're checking in and then they're just closing it down. <laughs> well, now that we know that they're here, we can like call them out and make sure that they're answering questions. <laughs> Todd screwing around getting his drink. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Jordan's watching. Hi, Nicole. Wow. Hey. Hey, girl. We have one vote for a series of mixology with Todd. <laughs> ah, <I think> <laughs> Is that vodka? Ooh. That's what makes it a Moscow mule as opposed to a Kentucky mule, which is bourbon. An hour with Rob. Okay. Mm. <laughs> 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 Better make it a double. Oh, uh, we have Jill Grinstead von Hagen, who is a former student of Carl Hall, is watching. Wow. We love Carl. Oh, cool. Paul Carl. Murphy is here. Good job, Paul Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> Man, these flute players, they're punctual. This is the magic <laughs> ingredient is the shrub from Bellingham. Oh. Oh, what flavor? This is the raw uh the raspberry citrus. Yum. Very good. Is that a bitter Todd? What what is that? Which? What you just put in the other stuff. The shrub, yes. Yeah, you know, it's like a, you know, it's a, um, it's like a. I guess the best other word would be like a cordial. Like it's a really intense, sweet distill. or intense sour or what is well, it? Well, it's it's um it's this line that I got at the. Well, actually, um, this was a gift. I got a set of the smaller bottles, but I did bring home a large bottle of, what was that flavor, Christina, that we tried last summer? Oh, it was ginger and yeah. Ginger something it was so that probably would be better in a moscow mule but um so it's it flavors really, or something they're flavors but it's a very intense tart because it's it it, it all of them have an apple cider vinegar base mm. so they're supposed to be really good for your whatever your alcohol <laughs> <laughs> or so we say I, I i drink it for my gut health <laughs> <laughs> You just have a gut feeling that you're I had a better gut. when you drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Cheers. It's great yeah. to see everybody for the first time in months. Oh, yeah. Cheers. 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 Yes. All right. So I guess on that on Sorry. that note, let's let's get this thing officially started. So thank you to everyone who's watching on Facebook. Welcome to Backstage Banter with your ATL Symphony musicians. Today we're featuring our lovely flute section. Uh, we have Christina Smith, Rob Cronin, Todd Skitch, and Gina Hughes, and I am Emily Brebach. I play English horn and will be moderating the comments. So if you have any questions that you want um, our flute section to answer, I will do my best to multitask and read the comments. Um, oh, I hear some echoes. Um, I'll bit do my best to read the comments and also uh, throw these questions to our lovely flute section. So why don't we start off? A couple people have been asking Todd, what are you drinking? Oh, uh, I just made a Moscow mule. Can you tell us what's in a Moscow mule? I know you were just talking about it, but just for uh, the people who are just joining in. It's a vodka drink with um, uh, fresh lime juice and ginger beer. And my secret ingredient is a shrub that I, I 
have brought back from Bellingham, Washington and bought it at a farmer's market. And they come in flavors and have an apple cider vinegar base. Nice. So Bellingham is where you and Christina play in a festival together in, during normal summers, right? Normal summers. That was canceled <laughs> this summer, um, obviously. And uh, yes, so I spent the month of July sitting at home. <laughs> yeah, like, like Drinking most Drinking Moscow meals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Though I know we all we all missed going to our, our various summer summer festivals. Um, all right, so what have you guys all been up to during this stay at home pandemic quarantine stuff? Can I can I ask is is there anybody that actually went to a summer fed festival that anybody knows? I mean, or were they all canceled completely? I I don't know if I know anybody who actually. I don't went think I, I don't think I know anybody that kind of went or they anybody had anything. I was just curious. Yeah. I haven't I haven't heard of anything actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. I did read something about is it mainly Mozart or mostly Mozart in San Diego where they had chamber performances and the audience was sitting in their cars on the lawn. Oh cool. Mm. But that's the only thing that I've heard. Yeah. I did. I mean, I think I'm sure a lot of you did too, but I did like one or two master classes online for um for music festivals, but that's that's it. I didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so back to my my original question: What have you guys been doing when you are not at your summer festivals? <laughs> what's been What's been going on this summer? Nothing. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, all my festivals were canceled as well. I didn't never never did anything, but I did teach a few classes, but. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, when we first, everything started uh, shutting down, I was like enjoying the time, I have to say. I was so burned out and I was just really loving not having to um, stay in shape and play. And just having the time was like, it made me so happy and having more time with the kids and um, more time to like practice things that I wanted to practice, not things I had to practice and clean my house and stuff like that. But then as time went on, I started to get really anxious and antsy. Um, but um, but I, some of the things I've been doing are just like, uh, I'm just, I like to be home. Like I'm just cleaning my house and I, I grew a whole bunch of vegetables this summer and that was really fun. Oh, um, what did you grow? Um, I got four different t types of tomatoes and zucchini and cucumber and kale i mean not kale a uh, swiss chard um and yeah so that, that was really fun um because i'm usually not here at all in the summer so it was just really nice to have a garden and um yeah and then paul and i started tearing off the floor in our basement because we were going to do one of these <laughs> diy projects <laughs> there's no such thing as a diy project in your house and of course like we pull the floor up and what do we see black bolt <laughs> so, oh, no. so oh, wow. that's been um quite quite an experience getting that into <laughs> and mold remediation and you know of course the all the the new stuff that's going on the floor is sitting in my basement i hope the boxes get open and installed at some point but it's just it's been a much bigger process than we hoped but now we we know it's there now it's gone and we can move forward so that's good oh, yeah, that's, that's about it Rob and I would be over there to help, but you know, COVID and all, we better not. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely had a quintet coach in high school who would uh, get all of the people in the Woodwind Quintet program over to her house to like move things and like do, you know, do manual labor around the house. But I know we can't, can't do that anymore. Not right now, at least. Rob, what have you been up to? Well, um, I mean, in the opposite way of what Christina said, um, having that time, I, I immediately thought, you know, I really should practice. And I know that sounds funny, but um, there is really no excuse because you have as much time as you can. And so I've been practicing a whole lot more than I normally would during the regular season because, you know, you're really not preparing for something specific, but that's also the problem is that you're really not preparing for some, something specific. So it, it it's, it's a double-edged sword, but, you know, everybody kind of um, in, in the midst of their like 20th season or something around 30th season, they go, you know, if I could just have some time off and I know that's probably not 
right to say that you know, with everybody having all these troubles, but for people that have suffered like violinists and whatever in their in their hand and all this kind of stuff to have a little bit of downtime now granted this is getting a little bit a little bit extended we can kind of maybe bring it back around and start up again or something but it's it, it, it it's been nice to to just focus on that sort of sort of stuff um and as christina said to to just work on some things that that you never have had time to work on or a concerto or a you know, a sonata that you, you haven't played yet because it's too hard to work on. You never have time to focus on it or whatever. Um, and I also, because um, I write music occasionally, I, I thought, you know, if I end this whole time and I haven't written anything, I'm going to be really mad. So uh, I started writing a book of ca ca caprices and um, I'm about halfway through it. I kind of took a break because I got too, uh, it got too intense for a while. But Is it uh, for solo flute? Yeah, they're like um, fantasy sort of thing, and they'll probably be be twelve. There's I have six of them done now, so. But, very um, te very Telemann of you. No, <laughs> you would not mix them up with that actually at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I start practicing practicing, and I'm like, this is hard. I mean, it's, it's really tricky in spots, and I I of course know that, but. Um, and um, then the other thing, I also have my bi business that I started um, a long time ago, 2007, uh, that I make uh, counter concrete countertops. And um, uh, there's been a few times in the in the past 13 years that it's come in handy, and this is obviously one of them, where um, it kind of is a nice way to sub supplement work and uh, in income. So that's been pretty pretty steady throughout the, this time too. So. How about you, Tad? What's been going on in the world of Tad? <laughs> well, um, like like Christina said, um, at first I was really enjoying the time and I was trying to be one of these people that was doing everything that needed to be done, but there was never time, like clean, cleaned out the entire garage and got a fridge for out there and put up storage shelving and painted the back deck myself and Oh, wow. There's a hill behind the house that's not my property, but I weed it. Like, just things like that. I was just going gangbusters. But then, you know, after, I don't know, after May, I, just, I fell into the COVID funk, I think, and got a little just, <laughs> like, all those large projects were done, and then you're just sort of faced with the day-to-day, -day really gritty. So then we decided to... Um, expand the family and adopted a couple of kittens and uh, and it, it got a little bit crazy these people probably <laughs> already, already know what i'm about to say but so we we, ha we had one cat in the house and then we tried two fosters um fosters mean they're not with you forever but they're still with us so um <laughs> They're still fosters. If anybody needs a lovely pair of cats, <laughs> <laughs> they're adorable. Uh, Franny and Zoe, um, named after the Salinger novel. And then we adopted two kittens, um, Whiskey and Gimlet, their brother and sister. They're here. They might make an appearance tonight. And yeah, then, please, and also, and also, coincidentally, while all this was going on, first <laughs> there was a feral family in my community's storm drain. Um, a mama and three kittens. So I called my shelter and we trapped them and they spent a night in my garage and they were all fixed and the three kittens are up for adoption and the mama was fixed and released, but she's too wild to be um, a pet. So she, she was just released back on the property. And then another cat, show, kitten <laughs> showed up in the storm drain by the pool <laughs> and I trapped her by myself and she was kind of injured and lost a couple toes. And she she's in the house. She's she's a foster, but she but she is up for adoption. As Christina Smith would say, she's a foster, and um, but she is up for adoption at Snap to it. It's a wonderful volunteer um, organization, animal rescue and shelter. Snap to it, and um, she'll get adopted. She's super cute. But right now there are six cats in my house, so just feeding, <laughs> scooping, cleaning. It's, it's it's in a way i mean it's 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 a it's a ton of work but it's been really great and rewarding and you know you get snuggles all day long and 
Yeah. How old were your other two cats, Todd? Yeah, uh, Buddy and Holly, they passed away um, a few years ago. They were 20 and 21. Oh, wow. Yeah, good long lives. So, so these we, are all six cats that you've gotten since? No, uh, my husband has a cat, a uh, 15-year-old. She's still with us. She's very pissed off all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's, she's a big ball of anger, but... Um, Let's go get her. <laughs> no. This is, this is the boy. This is my boy kitten. He's oh, he's so pretty. Which one is he? Which is his name? Whiskey. Whiskey. Oh, so cute. So that's what's been going on here, practicing, trying to practice every day and exercise every day. And so that between that and six cats. You know. <laughs> that's that's a lot. Awesome. Gina, how about you? What have you been up to? <laughs> Well, started out the quarantine making a baby. Woo, Whoa. quarantine baby. <laughs> <laughs> We're calling this generation the coronials. So, nice. made a coronial. <laughs> um, and uh, I have just been taking care of my daughter, 21 month old Clara. And um, man, it's tiring, guys. I miss work. Wow. <laughs> Props to all the stay at home moms because I only have one child and I have no time to myself. It's insane. So, um, yeah, it's like, what is it? Almost six months of no daycare. <laughs> so, I miss daycare. I miss work. <laughs> um, so what have I been doing day to day? A lot of coloring and <laughs> um, walks and pushing Clara on the swing. And, <laughs> um, and I have managed to do a little bit for myself. Like I sew. Um, so I, that quilt back there was my first ever sewing project. And I sewed this little oh, wow. number here. Wow. Look at you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been ever so slightly productive um, on my own when Clara is sleeping. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's just been, you know, we're all locked down. We're all stuck at home. So a lot of just like home stuff, like cooking and cleaning and chasing after the little one and dreaming about playing again <laughs> so um yeah yeah that's been me very, very good all right we have a couple of questions coming in from the comments section uh paul hinson asks for the virtual season will we see essentially a small chamber orchestra of players socially distanced on the stage who wants to take that one i think the answer is yes <laughs> it seems that that we will but um I think it kind of is, um, as everything is, a little bit week to week. So I think we have multiple types of, um, how do you want to say, um, solutions to how it's going to go and kind of um, a chess chessboard where we kind of can slide this in and slide this out depending on how, how things feel. And I, I think it'll be you know, the first week we'll go down and we'll go, all right, that sounded good. Let's let's just try and expand it with the second week. And of course it's planned out, but you know, you never quite know how it's gonna function. Yeah, I'm really curious how it's gonna, I mean, one of the things that we've been trying to do on stage um, before COVID was to sit closer together. Like mm -hmm. that was a big, a big push that all, we wanted to sit closer so we could hear each other better. Um, Cause our stage is huge, which, you used to be a, like a detriment, you know, because we would just kind of all space out and then we, we wouldn't quite be able to hear each other the way that we want to. But now having this huge stage is a, um, is a bonus because we can fit more people safely on the stage. But at the same time, it's gonna, it's gonna be a big adjustment to try and play these, you know, smaller classical and um, early romantic pieces with so much, with so much distance. I'm kind of, I'm really antsy to get on stage to, to try that, to just, figure out how that sounds and how we how we do that but yeah exactly 
And <clears throat> are we still, are the winds still going to be behind plexiglass, like on three sides? Do you guys I know? I don't think it's three sides. I think it might just be one, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Either way, like it's, this whole thing is going to be a, a big grand experiment. Let's just say that. Yeah. <laughs> but the operative um, word is small, right? I mean, because originally on the plan, we were going to do Beethoven five, which has two flutes and piccolo, right? But then mm -hmm. they changed it to Jupiter, which Mozart's Jupiter, which is just, um, what is that? Number 41. Um, mm -hmm. And that just has one flute. So, um, you know, I'm depressed because if there's just one flute, <laughs> I'll continue to sit at home drinking Moscow meals. <laughs> right. It's not good for my liver. And work on your podcast. Work on my right. podcast. Sure. Yeah. We have another question from Kevin Smith, who says the ASO's Daphnis and Chloe recording features amazing flute playing, but the flute section has turned over almost completely since then. Have you guys performed Daphnis yet with the current foursome? Oh, I might be related to that Kevin Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your brother? <laughs> I think so. There's, there's a lot of Kevin Smiths in the world. But I <laughs> Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Um, ha actually, have we played it together? We, we have. played it at Carnegie, well, we didn't we? No. Well, even That's after, this, yeah, in the last couple of years, since I've been here, we have played it. Oh, then, then yes, we have played it together. Weren't we going to do it this season or was it? No, we did it last season, I think. Yeah. Oh, we did it with, uh, we did the whole thing with June Merkel. Yes. Oh, that's uh, right. We did. <laughs> I yeah, and we were, all, we were all there. Yeah. As yeah. I, yeah. He thinks nice. he's going to stump us with this quest question. <laughs> <laughs> he almost stumped us. <laughs> we, uh, we also had one question, which I am obligated to ask because it comes from my father. <laughs> my dad is a, um, a very active uh, amateur flute player, and he wants to know about your, about your flute. He wants you to talk, Christina, a little bit about your, about your instrument. Oh, um, I don't know if your dad's on Facebook or if you can access the interview I did for Powell yesterday on Facebook, but um, I talked a lot about my instruments on, on that um, whatever webinar or whatever it was. But um, the instrument I've been playing most recently is made out of solid 14 karat white gold. And it's, it's very special because it was made in 1950 and it was handmade by Vern Powell. And um, he only made one white gold flute. And the reason he, he, and I have these original letters where he refers to this, the reason he only made one white gold flute is because he discovered when he started making the, uh, the keys and all of the little, you know, I have my flute here. Actually, let me play you a tune. <laughs> um, but, <it's, laughs> but, but, you know, you can see on the flute, you know, there's these keys and there's these rods. There's a lot of little parts and pieces that go on the tube. And, he said that it ruined all the equipment in the shop because white gold is so incredibly hard and dense to work with. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm never making a white gold flute again. And now um, it might be one of the only white gold flutes out there that all the mechanism is made out of white gold. Because now there are many, many white flutes uh, in existence, but a lot of them have a silver uh, keys and mechanism on them because silver is so much easier to work with. But he referred to it as his masterpiece and it's serial number 900. So he often saved the, um, the big numbers, you know, the, the, the 900, 1000, 1100. He saved those for, um, you know, flutes that he thought were really special. And this was one of them, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really great instrument. Um, I have three beautiful old cowls and the other two I have are made in 1938. And one's made out of silver and one's made out of platinum. Nice. That's very cool. Um, Gina also, because I know my dad is going to ask, my dad um, is really into piccolo in his retirement. Um, and yeah. and he's, um, what, what kind of instrument do you play? I keep, you, I keep asking you and then you tell me and then it goes completely out of my mind. So why don't you, you can tell my dad personally. <laughs> well, hello, Emily's dad. <laughs> so I play on a homig and it's made out of uh, cocos wood. Is that right? Wow. No, 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 no. It's Grenadilla. <laughs> I've been I've been looking at Cocos homigs. Um, but yeah, it's just a very standard Grenadilla homig. 
and it's very easy to play on actually the one sort of slightly unique thing about it is the lip plate it has like a modified wave on it and it also has um you know most piccolos just have in in the the head joint it's just there's a hole that's been stopped soldered in instead of having a raised lip plate like on a flute um, but on my piccolo, there is actually a tiny raised lip plate. And that's how they're able to achieve a little bit of that modified wave. So, Is that like the, the, the bulb that I see on the end of your head joint? Is that what you're talking about? No, no. That's just the design of all homigs. They, oh, okay. um, is it, it's conical, I guess, the head joint. So it's skinnier on this end. And then as it gets to the body, Suddenly there is this bulge that connects to the body, but yeah, that's, that's not related to the lip plate. Hmm. Very good. Um, another thing that um, has come up since we were talking about the Daphnis and Chloe, do you guys have any, any favorite recordings that you've played on since you've been in the ASO or favorite things to play with the orchestra? I know I keep trying to remember back to like, you know what it was like to play in an orchestra six months ago. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, do you guys have any favorite pieces to play with the ASO? I've listened to, um, strangely enough, because it came up on my phone, is our recording of the um, Berlioz, uh, was it Mass or what is it called? Um, Requiem? Oh, yeah. Requiem, yeah. And um, it's this gigantic piece, and we played it in like, what, oh, two and a half? And um, Christina can tell this story, but um, I mean, there is a there's a part in it where uh, the brass are there's like I don't know how many twenty brass on this side of the of the stay of, of the hall on the top and then twenty on this side and it's gigantic and and you know how Ber Berlioz has this thing he's building and building and building and then all the brass come in at one time and Christina was pregnant like six months and during the recording se session came out of her chair at the moment that the, that, that the brass kick came in, she goes, oh my God, I'm like, you know, because, you know, it just woke up the child and it was just, <laughs> it was so funny. And so that that was in my car the other day and I was cracking up because it scared me because it comes out of no nowhere, it just kind of, but it's a beautiful recording. And I don't know, I don't know if Spano's listened in the recent years, but it's it's so nice. It's like, like the quality of the hall, the hall sounds really pretty and the orchestra is really balanced and, you know, that's the one where like there's there's like pods of brass like all over the hall. Right? Yeah, did, I think so. Did you record so. it like that? Did you guys record it with like people in different places in the hall? Oh, cool. I actually I think that Berlioz recording, unless we've recorded it twice, I think that was done before I got here. I think it might be a um, an older or no maybe you know it all runs together. <laughs> I can't remember, <laughs> but but that is a true story about the. The baby in the womb, man, she was all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Is this your older daughter? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I, I want to hear from Todd and Gina if there's favorites that you've done more recently than uh, you know anything Rob and I have done. Well, I, I, I mean, I was particularly proud of the Von Williams CD. That was the first recording we did since I got, I joined the orchestra, because I joined in 13. I think we did Von Williams in 2014 with Lark Ascending with David Kusharan playing the solo and the symphony number no. four, which I'd never played before. And that was quite an experience. Um, I know Gina wasn't here yet, but and also Carl was, was still with us and playing and so that that was a special that was a special time for me. But I've but as far as playing with the orchestra, I always I don't know why, but I always love playing Rachmaninoff symphonic dances, and I know the ASO has recorded that, and that was before my time here. But um, I don't know why, I just love playing that piece. Um, with yeah, there's, there's something about Rachmaninoff in this orchestra. I totally agree. I that recording came out before I came before I got into the orchestra too. Um, but I love listening to that recording when every time that we have to play, we, that it's, it comes up at work. You know, I just always go back to that recording to listen to it, to prep for, um, prep for, for work. And that's always, that's a very, still a very cool thing that I 
for me, like that I can, I can listen to old ASO recordings to prepare for work, you know, cause we just have such a, a large discography. It's, I don't know. I find it pretty cool. Oh, Gina, and you- all through college. I mean, I, I mean, ASO in Cleveland, that was all I would listen. I mean, of course I would listen to Montreal cause I was going to school in Montreal and studying with, um, with Tim Hutchins, but um, you know, they play a little higher, but, but as far as just playing along with recordings, it was every ASO and every Cleveland recording. And it was all about Christina Smith and Josh Smith. <laughs> they were both named Smith, both starting around the same time, 90 and 91. So that's, Man, I was just listening to all those recordings and just playing along with them in my living room. Yeah. Gina, how about you? Are there are there pieces that you really like playing? Have you how when did you start here? Is this your fourth season? Uh this season? Well, I started in 2017. So um what would that be? 17, 18, 19. Six so years ago. My fourth. Oh my. <laughs> so um I have only done two recordings so far one was not released it was the uh orfeo and then the Mi- michael kurth cd you're also participating i think that's the only two recordings i've done but um i think probably my favorite piece that i've played with aso so far has been one of the shostakovich symphonies and you guys are gonna have to help me because my brain is like half <laughs> not here anymore. Was it Shostakovich 10, Todd, where we had that little duet together? Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, it was so terrifying. I think that was my first season. Um, and I was like still getting used to the job and everything. And like, oh my gosh, I was so nervous. But it was such an incredible experience getting to play that and do that duet with you. I mean, it's like such an eerie moment in the symphony to begin with um but getting to do that was yeah definitely a highlight so far oh and you were such a highlight of that symphony isn't it is it a b the last note you hold what f sharp i think at the first movement there's the duo you know there's the little two piccolo duo you know which is um for a second flute player that's like a very standard excerpt for the a second flute audition because they know you're going to have to play that part I, i'm pretty sure i had to play that um at my audition to, to for the aso um, and then you continue and it was just perfect every time it was so great you sounded so good <laughs> oh thanks i don't know <laughs> that it was perfect every time but no i think it was perfect. <laughs> it's not just the moscow mule <laughs> <laughs> keep drinking keep drinking <laughs> yeah and yeah. it's also really helpful because Carl was so meticulous. You, the flute section knows this, but for our listeners, Carl was very meticulous about writing information down in the parts and he would write down specific fingerings. And so he had this amazing fingering for that last note that lasts you know, forever. And I'm the only one playing and I'm just holding it forever and ever and ever at pianissimo. And so he like saved my life because I had this fingering that was so easy. And I was like, yes, thank you, Carl. I can't tell you how many times I have thanked him. And, and do you remember, Gina, I don't know if we have time for embarrassing stories, but I think if that whole thing about embarrassing stories was going to come up. This was this was the concert I was going to talk about. Because of course there's the, this tiny bit of um, second piccolo and it's only for like what Gina like 12 measures or something mm-hmm. um I mean it's so beautiful but I mean the second flute player hardly played that I mean that's all you play like four notes and um and, and of course we had all the rehearsals I don't know if it was the first concert and you know what there's so much other stuff in the orchestra so I'm warming up on flute and looking at all the hard stuff and Let's see where this is getting, going getting focused and then, you know, we're taking the A and I, you know, I have the double, pe- we have the double pegs, you know, so the piccolo is at the same and I go and I tune my, I'm go- I go to grab the piccolo and my hand just like, <laughs> and, and it wasn't there. So and don't ask me, <laughs> I just kind of looked, I kind of looked at Gina and I was like, you can bleep this, right? And, um, <laughs> no, I can't. I can't believe it. Don't curse. Don't curse. <laughs> and I don't know how. It was a very out of body experience. But somehow, 
I got the piccolo backstage and was back in my seat and still took the A. Wow. Like that, that's somehow I moved. I don't even know how it was possible, but somehow I got off the stage, got the instrument, got back and still tuned it at the end of the string, um, string A. You must have booked it. Holy cow. Yeah, but that was, I can just remember this feeling of whoosh. <laughs> and I was like, what? What? Stop it. You're making me so nervous right now. <laughs> well, of course, you know, you have all the, the big solos and we just have a duo for like 30 seconds. But so you're there warming up the piccolo. But, you know, I have to warm up the flute for 20 minutes to 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 play with that one. And um, <laughs> she's right here for me. I don't know if she's right here for us. <laughs> She loves it when I poke her at work. Um, I know. <laughs> totally. <laughs> All right. We have, we have two questions in the comments that are kind of related. John Samuel Roper said, hi, guys. If you were told that tomorrow you could play whatever piece you'd like COVID free, what would it be? And then Nicole Chamberlain asked, if you were given the opportunity to play any concerto of your choosing, what would it be? Gina. Me. <laughs> well, if I could play a concerto on the piccolo, it would be the Vivaldi, simply because that's our standard and I haven't gotten to do it yet. So hopefully soon. Um, I'm going to have to think about the orchestral piece, though. Somebody else go while well, I think. I want to hear Gina play the Lieberman. Ooh. The Lieberman concerto? Yeah. That's a good one. I actually had to play that for an audition once. It was oh. a very odd choice, but uh, so yeah, I got to know the first movement exposition very well. <laughs> <laughs> How about you guys? I think I would, I mean, I would love to play something that just has a whole bunch of people on stage that got smashed together. You know, like I want to play, I want to play Shostakovich 10. You know, there's something about that fast movement where the entire wind section is just like doing these pyrotechnics all together, like in unison or, you know, in you know, octaves and just like feeling, feeling that, you know, of 12 people or, or, you know, 15 people or 16 people, however many people are on stage yeah. at the same time, all playing that together, like feeling all of our energy converging in that way. Cause I mean, I love playing with our wind section. I miss you guys. <laughs> but we there's like this, you know, this this kind of out of body experience where everyone kind of like, okay, we're in this together. You know, just anything that has that has that sort of a feeling. But I know that the the fast movements for Shostakovich symphonies always kind of feel like that to me. It's also a little bit, you know, like edge of your seat. You're not you always feel like you're about to fall off the about to fall off the the wagon, or at least that's how I feel. And we've played we play Shostakovich faster here than anywhere I've ever played. Um, and I remember the first time we had to play it, I was just like, like, ah, <laughs> don't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would like to do. Just anything with a lot of humans on stage, really, mm -hmm. really close together. I find my myself missing Mahler because we tend to do Mahler like once or twice a season, and I could use a. Uh, just if we could just get on stage for an hour, it probably is not going to hurt anything and just play Mahler six through. <laughs> and then we'll just break for another few months. We, I just want to read it one time, you know? <laughs> so everyone come together, play Mahler six, get and then COVID, just go. go away for three months. <laughs> we won't we'll say, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> It'll be our little secret. <laughs> well, hopefully the percussion section has that giant Mahler hammer hiding somewhere yes. in there. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool if you've seen that yeah the box the, the big box, box. yeah <laughs> <clears throat> i saw a con concert speak speaking of that in in college and it was the um i want to say like the moscow symphony or the saint petersburg or something and they came to Ch chicago and um i was up in the upper bal balcony and they were doing Mahler Mahler six and i didn't know the piece well enough but i could i could notice that the percussion guy he was in his chair for like, what, 45 minutes? And then all of a sudden, like he st stood up and he's like, you know, stretching and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, what's going on back there? And then he picks up this thing and it's it's a tree trunk with a, it's bigger than like a bat, bas basketball size thing. It's a massive thing. And, and, and he starts like loosening up and I'm like, this is gonna be good. and. 
when it when it came time, it, it looked like he was doing a jumping jack. I mean, he, he came <laughs> down on that. And and of course, the, the hall is really live if you play there. And, and it, it just it was amazing. I couldn't believe but but watching him prep for like 10 minutes to just this, this one shot, you know, very me memorable experience. That's fantastic. Yeah. Todd and Christina, what, what piece would you want to play? Or what concerto, if you could play any concerto, would you play? Um, first, hi, John Samuel. Hi, Nicole. Um, uh, I'm with Rob. I would choose a Mahler symphony again. Like, like you said, Emily, it's like I'd want to have as many people on stage as possible. I mean, I would go back and, you know, next year's my 30th season in the orchestra, and I've played Mahler 10 once, and it's probably the only time we'll ever do it. But I would go back and do that again any day. I mean, just the hope and transcendence that the last movement has of that piece. There's really, for me, nothing else like it. I mean, there's so many amazing pieces, but I would, I would choose that. And um, I would, I would actually, as concertos go, I would choose the Rouse, Christopher Rouse Flute Concerto. Uh, Such a great piece, so well written for the flute and um, extremely profound. And I think it would fit humanity for right now. Awesome. Have you performed it before? Yeah, I, I played it once with the ASO and um, it was my first week back after my first maternity leave with my older daughter. You played a concerto <laughs> your first week yeah, back? I, I did. <laughs> um, but it was really cool because when we did it, um, I guess it was 2004, 2004. And, um, the second movement of the piece is kind of a memorial to a young, you know, a toddler who had been killed. And um, we did it with Marin Alsop and she had just had her first child, a son, and our, our kids were the same age. And we both came to this piece and she's a Rouse expert. And it was so wonderful to experience this with her because she um, really knew the piece. And it was just, it was, it was, a, very memorable experience for me. Didn't you also do a concerto nine months pregnant? <laughs> I close, close. <laughs> I can't remember what I played, but I that sounds right. It was like Mozart G, right? Or flute and harp concerto. I maybe some, flute and harp. Mo Mozart, maybe it's Mo a, a Mozart. It might have been. Yeah. A, yeah. That's the other end of the spe spectrum. <laughs> as far as. as as hard as possible. That's what Christina chooses. <laughs> <laughs> Could and, you she ran, and she ran a marathon on that week. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, I ran a marathon too. <laughs> oh, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> Todd, how about you? What are you looking forward to? Or what would you want to play? Oh, well, I don't, I don't play concertos. <laughs> uh, how about but, something uh, with the orchestra? What would you want to play with the orchestra right now? Oh, I, I have no idea. Um, actually, Emily, it's a coincidence that you're moderating, but I really want to play, if I ever get a chance to play a concerto, I really want to play the Onager for flute oh, and yeah. horn. I think, I think it's so beautiful. Um, my teacher, Tim Hutchins, recorded it with a group in Montreal. Um, and it, it's, I really love that piece. Um, I would love to do that sometime. Of course, I love playing Brandenburg Four, which is one I actually get to play on. Um, <laughs> But as far as a solo solo, that's not my personality. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the Christopher Rouse is beautiful. That's that's a piece that um, you know years ago before I was in the orchestra, Christina gave me a copy of her performance, and I I bought the music and learned the piece. But but I'm I'm never you know I'm not going to play it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. We we have a question from Jill Grinstead von Hagen, who says, my daughter Charlotte is 11 and started taking flute lessons last year with Jeannie Carreri. She'd like to know how old each of you were when you started playing the flute. Mm -hmm. I was 10, I was in fifth grade, started in uh, the California public school band system. Uh, but I also started on piano when I was five and I was already like a pretty serious mm -hmm. piano student at that point. So it, it helped a lot just to have that background before I started on the flute, but not necessary. Did you, did you keep playing piano when you were when you started flute? I did, yeah. I continued it kind of more seriously than the flute until I was a senior in high school and then realized I kind of had to choose between one or the other. I couldn't keep them both up. So I went with the flute. 
Makes sense. Awesome. Christina, how old were you when you started playing the flute? I was seven, um, and I, I went to Catholic school, and they didn't have a music program. So um, the way that I got started is I saw a flute on Sesame Street, and I begged to, for lessons because I just fell in love with it. And I, I said, I want to play that. And um, so I, I asked to talk, take lessons before I was seven, but my arms weren't long enough to reach the keys. But now they have these flutes that have like the curved head joint for the little kids. Um, but I had to wait until you know I could actually reach it. Um, yeah, so I started when I was seven. Nice. Rob, how about you? Um, I played cello in the fifth grade. But that was just because there was there was only strings available because I knew for some reason I don't know why that I already wanted to play a wood woodwind, um, and I hadn't really decided on what one. So um, my mom tells this story that we went into the big giant room where they had all the all the stuff out and you're supposed to choose what what you want to play, and she said, um, "What do you want to play?" And she goes, "Before you answer, do not choose the clarinet." <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> she, she said that I said the pic, piccolo, which I don't remember. But um, she, she goes, how about the flute? And I said, fine, that's, that, that's fine. So I think that was sixth grade. And um, I don't know what age that is. But by the time I was in eighth grade, I had pretty much decided I was going to do this come hell or high, high water. So um, much to my parents, like, they didn't understand anything about you know, not not to not to diss on them, but they they had no idea. You know, the drive that that I had in my brain. You know, and um, you know, a lot of luck and a lot of hours in a in a in a small room, as we all know. Right. Yeah. Todd, how about you? I was kind of a late bloomer on flute. I mean, I took piano lessons as a little kid, like Christina's age, like around seven. I started piano lessons. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know what a flute was until grade seven, um, in Canada, grade seven and grade eight are middle school. We didn't call it middle school, but it's essentially junior high school, I think is what we called it. Um, so I, I, I was pretty late starter, did not have super regular lessons. Um, and I really needed to go to college to lo really learn how to play. I mean, I, you know, I had some degree of talent, I guess, but um, <laughs> I, had, I had to work really hard through college to really learn what was required and expected. And I had no clue what an audition was when I started college. I had no clue what an orchestra job was, but um, I was very lucky to um, get to my schools of choice and teachers of choice and was very lucky because I had no idea what was going on. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, that's, I think <laughs> I think that that age eleven is is very common. Like a lot of people start um, start a wind instrument uh, around around sixth grade, around fifth sixth grade, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. um, so Charlotte, you're right on track. <laughs> Keep practicing. Um, so since Todd brought it up earlier, does anybody else have any funny stories about things that have happened on stage? I mean, I think the thing that is, um, I mean, our workplace is the stage, right? We don't have a desk, you know, or a, like a, you know, a phone line at work or a cubicle or anything like that. Like all, our work time is spent sitting on stage. So there, we spend so much time there. There's, there's always crazy things that end up end up happening do you guys have any any good stories i do because a few years ago when um i don't know if you were here todd but um the management in their wisdom decided that the saturday night concerts were going to start at 7 30 oh, instead of eight o'clock and this is after 30 years of everything starts at eight o'clock rob <laughs> yes you might be telling the story of my my first concert as no no it's not you it's me it's yeah, me I know I know I know, I know. Oh, oh, oh were you there this is was I there this is kind of burned into my memory sir <laughs> would you like, like to tell the story like you need to pay you need to pay for my therapy <laughs> I didn't re realize it was your first concert it was my first concert oh your first concert 
So, you know, none, none of us want to look at our phone and see the per personnel man, man, manager's number pop up at an inopportune time. And as soon as it popped up, of course, this is after having um, like email, phone messages, friends calling you. Just every Saturday, I had all this kind of stuff pinging me all day long because I have to remember I got to get ready an hour early or whatever. So uh, she, she calls me up and I was on the road at, um, it was like 725, I had left early and I was still 10 minutes away. And so, um, of course, I went slightly faster at that point and uh, pulled into the garage and got on the stage and um, Su Suzanne was there. And it was like a Haydn, was it Haydn, Todd? Haydn <laughs> sym sym symphony. Yeah, it was a Haydn symphony with two flutes. With two flutes. So, um, and it was, it was um, you know, 729 concert yeah. at 730 and I was the only flute player in the building. There you go. And, <laughs> but the, the, I, could, I could hear the first movement ending as I entered the stage area. They started without you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. And so then I, I whispered to Su Susan, I said, will you walk out on stage with me? <laughs> and she goes, this is your walk of shame. Not my. <laughs> and so I said a few opportune words, and then I walked out on stage very briskly, and we got to the second movement, and just on we went, so... There you go. Just like pretending that there was an offstage first flute part for the first. I movement. had to get my piccolo because I left it out <laughs> off of it. But it hasn't happened since then because then we've gone back to eight o'clock and everything's fine now. So. Right. I remember that was a problem. There were a bunch of people who who. Uh, Every week. Get... Yeah, it was something. Oh gosh, it's so scary. Anybody else have any funny stories? Things that have happened. Let's Wait, hold on, Todd. What happened in the first movement? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Um, <laughs> I can't believe we're talking about this. Um, <laughs> so, like, keeping in mind, okay, I think, um, you know, I, I had subbed here a few times over the years because uh, I was within driving distance. You know, I lived in Memphis and I was in the finals when Rob got the job, um, both for the one year and for the permanent. So I, I played whenever you guys did something that required a fifth, um, something that was planned well in advance, you know, because I had oh, a job. Yeah. So for a Rite of Spring or Cunning Little Vixen or I don't know what else, something Mahler maybe. Um, anyway, um, but so I subbed some um, before getting a job here. Um, and I think that night I was actually, um, there was the audition, there were trial weeks, the decision was made. I had been hired, but hadn't officially started yet, but I, I was hired as a sub that week. So I was driving to Atlanta. For some reason, my parents were here too. So like, it wasn't like I hadn't started the job, but you know, I was playing with you guys and I drove here and I found out I was gonna, start in the fall um this i think was in the just before the summer or something in 2014 and so and i'm sitting in my chair and and it starts with a haydn symphony and like i said i was like oh my god i think i'm the only flutist in symphony <laughs> and uh um suzanne walked out and said um you know you need to play first right now <laughs> <laughs> i'm just like what the what what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't work here. I'm just a I don't remember <laughs> this part of the story. This is, I told you this part of the story. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> we went out for dinner with your children. And you, you, you heard all about it. You heard all about it. At the restaurant formerly known as Garrison's, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, there you go. This is burned in your memory. This you is, oh, Emily, this is burned. I mean, <laughs> and anyway, so yeah, so everybody sees me kind of go. <laughs> <laughs> and which was fine, except, you know, I, I didn't, you know, obviously I was a little nervous to be sight reading at my first concert, like on the job to be sight reading a part. And I think Yvonne Patterson was playing principal oboe. And unfortunately I didn't get any advice about 
so, you know, the piece starts, I mean, I can't tell you what key it's in. I can't tell you what, how it starts. I can't sing the melody. I don't have, it's not that burned in, but, um, at the start, you know, the first oboe and first flute are in unison. So as we started, it really sounded horrible because the second flute part wasn't there. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm kind of, I, I, I do matter after all. Yes, but, absolutely. <laughs> but it sounded really <laughs> empty with these winds just playing the same note. You know, it's just like, oh my God, who wrote this crappy piece? <laughs> like there's no, there's no harmony. And that's the Mo Moscow mule talking. No, no, that's reality talk. <laughs> so, oh yeah, my gosh. You were, you were on my list for a while. I hear you. <laughs> that is that is the stuff of nightmares. I think I had I had like my first uh, like orchestra nightmare again like a, like a week or two ago, and it was one of the it was actually it was that we were playing a Bocelli. Um, Andrea Bocelli stadium show and I couldn't find the right door to go in to get on stage <laughs> and the, the conductor for that for that show is um, notoriously um, uh, okay. demand, demanding he's demanding so he was like screaming from the podium as I'm like frantically like trying to find the right <laughs> door in the stadium to like come down and get on stage but but that was just a dream I didn't actually have to do that in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I was get, I was gonna say we we're gonna really need a bleep a bleeper here if we're gonna talk about that conductor. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, I I I I, I self censored. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Elizabeth Remy Johnson is here. She says this is quality entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Gilman says she's very much enjoying the story and then a pained face emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people saying that this is their nightmare. Uh, really is, like quite literally, I think I've had that nightmare. Anybody else have any funny stories of things that have happened on stage? Christina, you have to have something to say. I, I don't, I was thinking about this earlier and um, I, I think I'm embarrassed every time I'm on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed about something. <laughs> oh man, I um, had um, I had a couple youth orchestra <laughs> moments, not necessarily ASO, but um, man, I just I don't know. I was not awake as a youth. <laughs> I just <laughs> kind of walked through that whole teenage stage, like half asleep or something. So I did a bunch of stupid stuff in youth orchestra. Like I came to rehearsal one time and my flute case was like unusually light, but you know, whatever. I went and sat down and I opened my case and no flute. And so I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? So I stowed my flute case away in the bathroom and I came to the conductor and I was like, I'm so sorry, my flute's getting repaired this week. <laughs> so that was, wow. that was my, yeah. Thankfully, now, now, like, I always, I always check my bag as I'm driving to the hall, like, oh my gosh. Um, and then there was a con another youth orchestra moment, again, something with me and my youth. Um, so that's when you have to make all the mistakes. Like, luckily, yeah. if you make those mistakes when you're a teenager, it's burned into your brain. So you do think, like, I do the same thing. Like, I just, like, stop halfway to work and, like, pull onto a side road. It's like, is my elbow really there? Like, do yeah. my reads and I can't. <laughs> Totally. I am so glad that this next thing happened in youth orchestra and not on stage at the ASO because it was, I had like had my first cough attack during a concert and I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot interrupt the oboist solo right now. Like this is horrible. This is so awkward. What do I do? So I just held it in, held it in, held it in. And you know what happens when you hold in a cough? It starts like erupting out of you. And so I had this like convulsion and I basically like cough sneezed and I had this handful of snot <laughs> and I was like oh my god and I looked at the flutist next to me who of course happened to be somebody who I'd met that day he was like just a sub brought in for the concert and I was like, <laughs> and he's, like he's looking at me and he goes and he pulls up his pant leg and points to his sock. And it's like. <laughs> I, don't under, I don't understand why he didn't have tissues for you. What, what's wrong with him? 
course, Todd, you would have. You uh, always do. <laughs> if Christina ever sneezes, I hand her a tissue. It's my job. I swear, <laughs> I see. He, he reaches down and gets out the tissue. I mean, <laughs> right? Totally amazing. And a Ricola, a Ricola, and a and a gin and tonic. I'm just like. Uh, on our side of the stage, that's what Lauren and Jerry is for. She has she has Advil, she has tissue, she has cough drops. She's always prepared. Nice. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay, I have um, another question here from Anna Ayers Hobgood. I tell my students that we have things we do well and things we struggle with. I can't imagine you guys ever struggled with anything, but what was your weakest area as a player? What did you work super hard on to bring it to equality with other facets of your playing? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Read the end of it again. Emily, I was reading a comment while you said that. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, what was your weakest area as a player and what did you work super hard on to bring it to equality with other facets of your playing? I see the wheels turning. I mean, for me, I, I spent um, years in Memphis and, and um, the season there, you know, such a smaller orchestra and a smaller season and uh, a ma what we call a masterwork, uh, sorry, what they call a masterworks there, here's just a subscription. And we had a month to get ready for it. It was, it was such a, we had such a generous amount of time to prepare for concerts. So for me coming to the ASOs, you know, when, and I always have four programs in my bag. So like personal practice, forget about it. I'm, I'm just always like, Oh, I've got Shostakovich 10 and Mahler 8 and, and Jurassic Park. And uh, there's just so many things. I was, that's a kitten. That, <laughs> um, uh, for me, it was just keeping up with the pace was something I was really worried about coming to an orchestra like this one. And um, I just had to make sure I'm on the ball all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I think on the last one of these, I was we were all saying that we all have like the Star Wars um, music and Ludislavski concerto for orchestra and the Ravel left hand concerto all in our bags currently because that was what we were supposed to play through the end of March. So Star I have, like, Wars, you know, Star Wars is still in my bag. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like all this music that you know we were supposed to play, we all have like weeks of it, and um, yeah, that's just that's how the how it goes. How we, what how about how about you guys? Maybe not even when you were when you were coming to ASO, but when you were a student, what's something you really struggled with and had to had to work pretty hard on? Daphne's and Chloe. <laughs> it's so hard. It's just it's unreasonable. I mean, I can't tell you, of course, how, how many hours trying to play that fast part at the end, and just knowing that, um, I don't know if you know, it, it always was going to say, all right, blah 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 blah, and then this part to the end, and I'm like, all right, well, yeah. Yeah, you Something mean in, in professional auditions. That's, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always asked. Yeah. How about and when you guys were were younger, when you were when you were maybe in middle school or high school mm. or early college? What were the things that were you really struggled with? I think oh, I would grieving, say. grieving was always something I I still struggle with. I mean, it's just the flute is so hard just because it's I think the only instrument that most of your air doesn't even go inside the instrument. You know, it's like you have to get so good at um, just like efficiency and getting the most bang for your buck with the way that you're blowing and <laughs> efficiency. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think that's like, has always been my struggle. It was my struggle when I was young. I'm still, my, I still really um, stress out about that and uh, practice it a lot. And I find the breathing is such a, it's such a psychosomatic thing. You know, if you, if you worry at all, like the first thing if you're worried or nervous, the first thing that goes is breath capacity. It's like you're you're instantly reduced to like an 80% maximum. And some pieces, you know, just don't accommodate an 80% maximum, you know, it just has to be 100%. And for me, it's just, it's it seems mental more than physical almost. You know, you can practice it all you want, but it, for me, it's that moment when you're in the moment and the breath is either there or it's not there and it, it's it's almost like it's mind over matter absolutely i mean this one gets it every time <laughs> 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 and, 
And this one, because he circular breathes. But, um, <laughs> not fair. <laughs> not fair at all. It's only it's been 30 years, so, I mean. Gina, you sounded like you had, you had something you wanted to add to this. Yeah, when I was um, in college, I realized how behind I was on my technique. Because in undergrad, we would have studio class instead of private lessons. Like, you're... There were four or five of us in the studio and it was like Paris conservatory style where you basically got like a four or five hour lesson every week because you were sitting there listening to everybody else play and they were all listening to you play. And it was really intense, but it was like such a great education. Where but was at Manhattan School of Music with Robert Langevin. But um, I mean, wow, you were really put on the spot and he would not like he would not ignore any of the details so like he would have us play all of our skills like with a metronome and uh in front of everybody yeah yeah because wow. he had this whole it was basically if you're a flutist you know the tafnel and gobert bible it was basically the tafnel and gobert exercises all of them written out on two sheets of paper, front and back. Um, and it was just going from the lowest note, B, all the way up to high D. He just had changed everything to be the full range, all 12 keys um, and 12 minor keys. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was like terrifying because I'd be standing there in front of my peers playing my scales very poorly, you know, and I would have worked on them for hours and hours and hours and hours, but like could not get them at the tempo and could not get them perfectly even and like all of those things. So that was something that I really had to work on so much. And I'm glad that I had to do that because now as the piccolo player, I never play anything slow. I never play, <laughs> I like never get to play the pretty musical stuff, you know, like it's all the fast, crazy, high insanity. So uh, I feel like that, that paid off and having that peer pressure of everybody watching you and listening and like watching your progress throughout the year, that, uh, that was extra motivation for sure. Gina, do you, do you think those scales came from the Gilbert book? You know, that is it technical flexibility? Because Tim made me work from that book. You know, Robert and Tim were both in Montreal when I was at school. So I wonder if they both were Gilbert fans and used that book because all the scales go up to high D and, and arpeggios. Yeah, I wonder. I don't know. He never mentioned it, but it could likely be from that. But every, every Robert student knows we all have this stapled, like my my coffee is so wrinkled and battered and yucky looking now. Um, but yeah, it just is, it was a lot of hard work that I had to put in to get that down. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. Yeah, that's, that's again, one of the things is being an English horn player is that I, all I do is play slow pretty things. Oh man, I want your job, <laughs> let's trade. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it's it's not it's pretty it's pretty great. I, I do like it a lot. <laughs> and you well, do guys, it well. Think, oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I think our time is just about up. Um, thank you everyone who's been watching us on Facebook. Thank you to our lovely flute section for joining in on um, on this backstage banter. Um, please let us know in the comments uh, what other sections or musicians you want to hear next on backstage banter, and we will. See you the next time this happens. Good to see all of you guys. Thank you again for doing this. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sam.